Quantum computing is about to change the world, but can it change the world right now? For CNET, I'm Dan Patterson with Dr. Jerry Chow. He is the Senior Manager of Experimental Quantum Computing at IBM, my old job. Uh, Dr. Chow, thank you very much for your time today. Let's start with, with the basics. We've all heard about quantum computing, but what is it and why is it so powerful? And really, why do I care? Yeah, absolutely. This is a really good question. And I would say that uh, right now we're in a, a period of time where I think we've all become pretty comfortable with the concept of uh, exponentials. Uh, and so that actually has uh, some, some, some back, background for why we care about quantum computing, why it's so different to traditional classical computers. And um, that all lies in that with traditional computers, we, we, effectively program and process information as bits, right? Zeros and ones. But with uh, quantum computers, we follow the laws of quantum mechanics, which gives us the, the ability to unlock these different sets of rules like superposition and like entanglement. Uh, these are these concepts within quantum mechanics that means that your information gets treated entirely differently and in fact gives you an exponentially large space of computational space to explore in. And that is what is really fundamentally different between looking at a, a, a quantum computer and a classical computer. You effectively have this large, exponentially large space for you to process your information, perform an algorithm so that you can uh, potentially speed up certain types of problems that otherwise would take a lot of resources and a lot of time to do with just your traditional bit-based computations. Can you give me an example of one of these types of problems that quantum computing is really optimized to help solve? Yeah, so I mean, uh, the way to think about it is always to, to ask yourself, what are those problems that have this exponential feature space? That what, what, what really scales really poorly when you think about how you would solve it on a classical computer? And, and one really good one to look at is, in fact, um, uh, chemical modeling. So just understanding how molecular structure works, you end up having all these different uh, electrons, right, that make up a particular molecular compound. And all the electrons are interacting with one another, right? So you can have a large molecule with many of these electrons all interacting with one another, and those interactions grows exponentially. And in fact, uh, trying to uh, calculate some of those aspects of this molecular structure is what uses up a tremendous amount of today's high performance computing resources. Uh, so it really kind of pushes the limits on our traditional computers. Now, corollary to that now with quantum computers, we can in fact use these quantum mechanics, uh, the quantum mechanical properties of qubits to explore some of those aspects of these molecular structures uh, using a quantum computer, which you would really struggle with perhaps doing on a classical computer. IBM has put quantum processing into the cloud. Uh, what are the advantages of this? Why is uh, a, a cloud-based or distributed-based method of computing superior to having, say, one machine in one location performing these computations locally? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And I think that one of the... Um, so we, we first put... Um, quantum computers onto the cloud for the first time in 2016. Uh, at the time, it was only a five qubit quantum processor. But really what that did was open up an entire new avenue of how to explore using quantum computers. Up to that point, you would say that quantum computation has always just been something that's been in research laboratories or in academic laboratories, things that physicists would have to go and tinker around and turn knobs. But by placing it on the cloud, uh, we were able to have our quantum experience actually be an avenue for a very broad and diverse user base to really start to explore and to program a quantum computer. Up to that point, there was really not even a coherent, say, quantum computing language or like an interface for you to actually access it. And through this cloud model, we were able to now define the, that protocol so that end users can range from students that are just beginning to application developers that are interested in understanding chemistry or machine learning uh, to those that are physicists that are looking to understand and characterize the underlying system and improve it. 
I, I think a component of every discussion I've heard about cloud computing, at least in the last year, has been, okay, when will I see something that's practical and that I can use? And that's a fair question. But I think what might be more interesting is when when does cloud computing become something that is mundane and we don't experience one or two things, but we are I impacted uh, at, at a global scale by cloud computing, uh, by peripheral cloud computing. Do you mean cloud cloud quantum computing computing? or quantum cloud computing? Cloud quantum computing. Cloud quantum computing. Yeah, yeah. sure. I know. I think that's a really great question too. There, I think a lot of times uh, many, uh, we already start using traditional cloud computing without really even noticing it. Right. A lot of times, a lot of the, the processes that we 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 run are somehow done somewhere else on a server. Similarly, I think at some point, when as we progress along this developmental roadmap of improving underlying systems, at some point the underlying uh, systems will be capable of producing quantum advantage for some specific sets of problems. And then in that case, those, those sets of problems might feed into potential applications that, uh, that you're gonna look, be looking to perform computations on, and those applications will run on some aspect of, of the calculation on a traditional cloud computer and other aspects of it on a cloud quantum computer. And you wouldn't really even know it. It's just a different backend that your whole problem is distributed across in order for it to solve. And that really is the model that we see moving forward that uh, the, the quantum cloud uh, computers will make a difference. It, 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 it serves their hand in hand with traditional computers. It's not going to replace your traditional computers, uh, but it's suited to solve specific types of problems. And it's just like your traditional computers are still going to solve certain problems very well uh, in, in that realm as well. I love that hand in hand approach. So the last question for you, you said something really interesting there, which is uh, quantum advantage. We've also heard the jargon uh, quantum supremacy over the last year. Uh, if I'm a normal person, maybe I care about technology, but I hear jargon like this coming at me fast. Uh, help me interpret and understand so that while this new age of computing is coming at me, I can understand and interpret jargon like quantum advantage or quantum supremacy. Why do I care about these words and help me understand uh, or at least interpret the future that is not far off? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think to that end, what you're talking about with regards to advantage and supremacy, we we try to refer to advantage as really being the case where we can see real, uh, real gaps and real wins using a quantum computer for an actual important application over traditional computers, right? So that is really showing that you have an advantage for a, for a problem of interest using uh, a quantum computer. Supremacy has been thrown around the word itself, uh, actually referring to more of a mathematical type of demonstration of proof. And so it's really a particular case in which uh, for one particular problem, there's some type of uh, difference, right? That you can run on your quantum computer than your class computer. Um, but, but it has no real bearing on actual problems of interest. And so with a word like supremacy, a lot of times you think that uh, everything is done, that some, somehow quantum computers are already better than classical computers. But that's probably part of the reason that that jargon is, I would find it not very preferable because it's totally not that case. We still want to continue to, along this long, ro long road so that we will be able to achieve quantum advantage for actual problems of interest. And that's a lot of what we're doing at IBM today.